Matt Aiken. I'm Vice President of External Affairs with Mountainside Treatment Center up in Canaan, Connecticut, in the northwest corner of Connecticut. Uh, we, we, we analyze and talk about a person's nicotine use right upon admission throughout their stay. Um, we have a full-time nicotine counselor who runs the nicotine program. Uh, we have an open uh, nicotine anonymous meeting every Wednesday night. We've been doing this for years now and you know, got laughed at a little bit in the beginning, but people realize how important this piece is. And then we also started noticing people with a long-term sobriety, passing away at early ages, finding out why, and, and a lot of the times, they're nicotine-related deaths. So why get sober, change your life, save your life, have a beautiful life only to die from the non-ability to address the nicotine? My name is Sheila Weichs. I'm the manager of Alcohol and Drug Recovery Services for St. Joseph's Hospital in Marshfield, Wisconsin. We are part of Ministry Healthcare. I'm here today to talk about our history and how we have integrated nicotine dependence treatment into our alcohol and drug program. One of the um, thoughts that's been out in the addiction field for a long time is that and I, I guess I view it as a myth, I, this is my personal statement, so I'll just share that, is that if a person were asked to quit using nicotine at the same time we're asking to quit all the other substances, that their recovery will not go well, like we can't take everything away. Well, from a logical point of view, you know, we do have patients who come in that do not use nicotine. They use other substances, perhaps a multitude of them, we don't say to them, you know, it's okay, we want you to quit the alcohol, but you keep using that cocaine because we understand you can't quit everything at one time. So from a logical point of view, that argument didn't make sense to us. What was helpful is that when we did see in the research that, that there were at least some studies supporting the fact that quitting all of the substances at the same time decreased the likelihood of, of relapse. It is also supported by what we're seeing in interviews and contacts with our patients. We have people who only smoke when they drink. So if we said, okay, quit drinking, but it's all right for you to have that cigarette, the triggers are all there. They're, the use is together. We also have people who smoke a great deal, but they smoke much more when they drink. And when you're doing interviews with patients, this comes through all over the place. Um, as we've worked with patients, I've had some come to me who have uh, been pretty concerned about that idea of quitting smoking as they come in that by the time they leave, they're able to identify, you know, if there was a beer on that table and a cigarette, I'd go for the cigarette. I never knew that about myself. So that particular thought that, that you can't address both, we don't find that it bears out in actual practice, and there's research to support that it's not an accurate belief either. The first uh, treatment program in New York State to develop a tobacco-free policy was here in Rochester. It was an adolescent community residence. Um, in this facility, Mac, where we are now, this is the John L. Norris Addiction Treatment Center, one of the state-run facilities. This was the first inpatient rehab program in the state, and I believe it was 96, 90, 1996. And we did this, we partnered with uh, other inpatient programs in the community so that that level of care all had tobacco-free programming to avoid the concerns of, you know, competition, if you will. Um, so we've had experience of, of, to answer your question, starting this out simply because we thought it was the right thing to do in terms of providing quality patient care clinically, but then it led into, okay, now let's talk about it from a policy perspective. And over the years, it's now led to where we are now, which is state regulation change. So that there's this system uh, approach to how now we're going to ask providers across the state to deal with this based upon the lessons that we learned over the last 20 years of viewing the, the reasoning, the rationale, the importance of, of why this is a helpful thing to do. Hi, I'm Bill Panapinto, and I'm a Senior Education Specialist at the Tobacco Recovery Resource Exchange at the Professional Development Program at the University at Albany's Rockefeller College. And I'm here to talk with you today about some of my experiences in our movement in New York State to integrate tobacco use inter interventions, meaning tobacco treatment, tobacco-free policy, and tobacco education 
within our state's addiction service system. It's very hard for them to say, yeah, but. Because if you're talking about, I don't want my sponsor to die. I don't want to lose my sponsor. I don't want to lose my sponsee. I don't want to lose my coworker who has been in this field for 30 years because he still doesn't have a hold of his tobacco addiction. You know, really talking about that on a human emotional level and really looking at the relationships that are so powerful that in being able to engage people on that level, some of the issues about, yeah, well, it's too hard, or yeah, well, I don't really know about it, or yeah, well, you know, we might lose money, they just kind of fall by the wayside because they're just, they're just not as powerful. They're just not as powerful. It's really hard to say, look, the only way that I can really sleep with myself and, and know and, and be okay with myself and know that if I don't do something about tobacco, I mean, how can, how can I look at myself in the mirror and say that I'm being responsible, that I am really being responsible to my community, that I'm really being responsible to my patients, to my coworkers, and to myself, and, and, and really having the kind of integrity in, in my recovery and in, in the work that I'm doing if I don't do this. And it's when people start to really start to look at those issues that are hard, they're uncomfortable. Um, that when you're talking about those kind of issues, that, that that is very powerful, very engaging. And, you know, when you start to talk on that kind of level, that you can really kind of throw out all the other pretenses about wanting to look like a very, um, you know, capable provider and you can say, look, you know, maybe I don't know how to do it, but I know I need to do it. And let's start to look at some ways that we can change things because it's got to get better than this.